This is the Barbecue Central Radio Show, which is recorded live each Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Barbecue Central Radio Show is being brought to you by The Barbecue Guru, the original creators of automatic temperature control devices, now offering four different models for you to choose from. Rest easy knowing that The Barbecue Guru is controlling your pit temperature so you can get on with your life. Visit bbqguru.com or call 800-288-GURU for more information. And by Fred's Music and Tasty Licks BBQ Supply, your online barbecue and grilling superstore. From cookers to grills, wood chips and chunks, and everything in between, also be sure to try the Tasty Licks barbecue brand of rubs and sauces. Check Fred out online at tastylicksbbq.com. And by Stephen DeFranco Jewelers. Located in beautiful Willoughby, Ohio, Stephen DeFranco Jewelers is a family-owned and operated business looking to service the great folks of the barbecue and grilling world. Get free shipping and big discounts by mentioning my name and the term Barbecue Brother. Check out their inventory by visiting stephendefranco.com. And by Butcher Barbecue, with 30 years of experience in retail, wholesale, meat markets, food service, and customer service. Using that experience, everything they do and sell at Butcher's Barbecue comes from real-world knowledge. Check out their award-winning spices, sauces, marinades, and injections by visiting ButcherBBQ.com. Always trust your butcher. And by the Barbecue Institute. Take your barbecue to the next level with the Barbecue Institute class. Pitmaster Conrad Teddy Bear Haskins uses his years of catering and restaurant experience combined with food science and smoking secrets to help you understand how to improve your barbecue. Visit BBQInstitute.com and register for classes today. And by Barbecuers Delight Wood Pellets. Making pellets since 1994. Two-thirds oak, one-third flavor wood, giving you that sweet, succulent smoke that you're looking for on your meat, both for grills and bullet-style smokers and, of course, in larger quantities for your pellet-fed smokers. Find them at bbqrsdelight.com. This is Bobby. And this is Jennifer. And we're from Cleveland, Ohio. And you are listening to the Barbecue Central Show. So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike your match, and... Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to another edition of the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. What's happening? Happy to have you aboard here on a Tuesday. This is a show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. We are broadcasting live and direct from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, rapidly becoming known as the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I know that because in uh, East Lake, Ohio, brand new barbecue shop opening up as we speak. How about that? So, we have that to look forward to, amongst other things. Huge show tonight. Let's get into it. If you want to get in touch with the show, 877-448-0433. That's the phone number to call. You can also email the show if you want to. Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. Those are the two ways to get in touch with me if you want to. I either suggest or don't suggest that you do that. If you can formulate a sentence, if you have something to bring that's positive to the show, go ahead, lob me a phone call, do an email, whatever you'd like, and we will go ahead and run with it. Here's what's happening on the show in case you did not get the newsletter. If you didn't and you want to sign up for it, go over to the website, thebbqcentralshow.com, and sign up for it. It's right there on the front home page. Coming up at 14 past the hour, first timer to the show and a creator, writer of a substantially awesome blog, Sean Rice from Meet Me Blog. If you haven't checked it out, go ahead, Google it, meetmeblog.blogspot.com. I can't tell whether he's a better writer or a photographer or just an overall conveyor of cool things that he goes to. He was in New Orleans, visited some really cool barbecue restaurants, so we'll get a recap on that. Also, a little history about his particular blog and uh, the vision where he looks to take it. 35 past the hour. 
old, old time friend of the show, so old you don't even know on many levels, Rich Robin from Gator Pit, founder, owner, purveyor of premier offset style and cabinet style cookers. We're going to talk to Rich a little bit about proper offset pit maintenance. This is a guy that's going to know all about it. So Rich is a a veritable cornucopia of information when it comes to that. So we'll be talking to Rich, 35 past the hour. Then we'll get into the second hour. Everybody's favorite recurring guest, Meathead, will be joining us. We have a number of things to talk to with Meathead as well. So stay tuned for that. That'll be in the hour of 10 o'clock. Now, when I was talking about email... Here's what I'm talking about. This coming in from Rick Boone in St. Louis. Was listening to your show, heard your interview with Melissa Cookston. My wife and I are on vacation and ate lunch at the Memphis Barbecue Company. All I can say is awesome. Best ribs I've ever had. Also got to meet Melissa, who showed me around the place. Super nice lady. Also mentioned to her that I heard you on the show. Keep up the great work. I am a police officer in St. Louis, and I listen while on patrol. What? those criminals rick what are you doing stop listening to the show no, go ahead continue to listen to the show if you listen live you should call in you should chirp the sirens that would be awesome or better yet better yet why not arrest somebody live on there that would be awesome uh alan weighing in here we go uh, stay with the regular opening music please this is not a nightclub we are not on drugs alan guess what my show Stuff you don't like it? Beat it. Start your own show. I like the music. It's mine. It's my show. I'll do whatever I want with it. If I want to turn off all the lights, if I want to host a show naked, whatever. Yeah, taser. Do that. Like Paul said, taser them, Rick. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate you tuning in to the show. Also, email from uh, Phil McGrain. When do you think you'll be bringing back the competition roundtables or have the proliferation of high-priced classes killed the roundtables? I like that. I like the use of the word proliferate. Phil, as always, it is a, I don't know, it's a work in progress. I'm not going to say that your point isn't well taken or potentially an issue, but there's just a lot of other stuff. Uh, I, I got to really block out a month where I, I can get in those, because I'm sure there's a lot of top teams that would uh, actually come on and do that. So uh, take heart, we will have those. And I apologize that I haven't gotten to them, even though that I have like said that. All right. Uh, Survey Tuesday. <laughs> Here we go. You know what question number one is going to be, right? Did you watch the first episode of Barbecue Pitmasters? Yes or no? Follow-up question. Question number two. Did you like the new format? Question number three. Not barbecue-related, or I guess it could be, depending on what you like. What's your favorite band? Music band. What's your favorite band? There you go. All right. Now... Every once in a while, we'll have somebody approach the show. They want to give their wares away. And who am I to say no? I say yes. Easy Hook is back on. That's right. For the next two weeks, they'll be giving away not a one, not a two, but a three-piece set, either right or left-handed. During the end of the first hour, we'll give it away. And these things are fabulous, super sharp. They can lift up to 15 pounds. They've gained wide and cataclysmic fame. And uh, every once in a while, we do easy hooks with uh, Marsha Fox, now down in Texas. So, Marsha, always appreciate the product, and we'll figure out a way to get a winner. And again, a winner this week, winner next week. Now, I did want to address something very briefly. For those of you that either caught the show on replay last week, or you were listening live, and you heard me during Scott Roberts' segment get a call, unannounced, from John Marcus, executive producer of Barbecue Pitmasters Seasons 1, 2, and 3, plus a number of other shows. Executive producer of The Cosby Show, if you can believe. Some people called BS on that. They didn't think that that was actually a uh, spontaneous call-in from John Marks. It was somehow planned that I had this in my back pocket. I had scheduled Scott, but he knew he was kind of in on it. Absolutely 100% not the case. Look, I can't help the fact that I... And professional enough to be able to transition spontaneously, impromptuly, not a word. Wait, where's my word ding? Not a word. John Dawson, add that. Impromptuly and be able to conduct a professional sounding image with one of the top men in the barbecue industry. I can't help that I can do that. I can absolutely guarantee that that was not, that was not 
a planned call. This is not trickery, chicanery, or tomfoolery. So let me get that out. Uh, review of Pitmasters Season 3. Well, here's the first review. If you weren't like me and were able to get a sneak peek and you tuned in at the U200 package or less, guess what you saw? Sorry, guess what you saw? Nothing. You're going to have to upgrade to uh, 300 or higher. I'm not going to do that, by the way. Long involved explanation on why I'm not going to do that. A lot of people saying how bad the show is, this version, also have no problem laying out the contestants on their turn in boxes. Look, if the product was that bad, do you think it would have made past the judges without absolutely getting hammered? This isn't Warren Sapp and Art Smith. These are real barbecue people who compete and know what good barbecue is. Or food, for that matter, tastes like. If it was bad, they would say as much. Hell, Myron would probably throw it on the ground, uh, drop and take a leak, do all that great stuff that he's known for. Now, I find it very interesting that everyone who has a bitch can also cook better than the teams on TV. Sure you can. That's why you're on TV, right? No, that's why you're not on TV. Which brings me to my next point. I'm hearing a lot of, how do these teams get picked? Who the hell are these people? Blah, blah, blah. Look, you have the opportunity to turn in a video. If you didn't, you aren't the one putting on the show. What are you bitching about? These seem to be some kind of, or there seems to be like this misconception that teams on the show should also be the teams that are top 10, 15 in KCBS or FBA or whatever. That's not how it works, folks. Have you met or talked to some of these teams before? They cook great, however, you could probably get more entertaining conversation from the garage door. They have very little to no personality. There's nothing compelling about them. And if that's the case, why would anyone put them on television? Do you want to promote people going to sleep over an open flame? Because that's what you would be doing. You need to have compelling people on the scene. Bottom line, are there 20 teams that could cook better than the first three teams on the show? Perhaps. Are they going to come across TV well? Probably not. Otherwise, they would most likely be on there. Let me ask you something. Do you think that Bare Knuckles Barbecue, the Carolina Rib King, and Cotton Patch did a disservice to barbecue? Have they set the industry back in some way? Are people no longer going to cook because of what they saw on TV on Sunday? No. Man, oh, man, some of you people are something else. The best way to show your dislike for this show, don't watch it. If you don't like the show and you're tuning in every week, you aren't making your point very well. In fact, you're doing the exact opposite. Pitmasters doesn't give a rat's ass what you think as long as you tune in. So if this is the worst show ever, don't watch it. It's just that simple. And just so we're 100% clear, I'm actually not a fan of the format of the show. It's not the cooks. It's not the people on there. I like all that. I'm just not a fan of the format and the style of this kind of show. It's nothing really that separates this format from a lot of the other chopped shows that are out there. Yeah, different because it's barbecue, but that's it. And I'll attempt to watch it because I can't even get it because of my TV packages we already mentioned. And I'm not going to upgrade packages just to see the show, but I would watch it because I feel like I have an obligation to the industry to make sure I'm following it properly. So there you go. Just my take. But geez, I mean, some of you people are pretty know it all when it comes to what is good or bad barbecue television. And believe me, some of these people that you think should be on there should not be on there. I talked to them. Trust me. They should not be on there. And I currently have zero Emmys for television. <laughs> oh, Sylvie, you're funny. A uh, quick service announcement from the... Uh, my barbecue brother lives here in Cleveland. Stephen DeFranco from Stephen DeFranco Jewelers. He's a barbecue junkie as well. Father's Day coming up, Sunday, June 17th. That's only in a mere couple weeks. What to get dear old dad? New clothes? Probably not. New tie? He hates that stuff. Forget about it. Stephen DeFranco Jewelers has the perfect answer. It's a new watch. Steve has an incredible selection of watches that would be perfect for dear old dad. I have mine. Bowl of a watch. Had it about a year now. Why spend a ton of money on a watch if you don't have to? Bulliver watches are stylish. They're affordable. They start under 200 bucks. You got the conographs. You got the skeletons, traditional styles. You fill the Bulliver line of timepieces. Again, under $200. It's fantastic. Then you have that Precisionist. It's the most accurate watch in the world. It breaks the second hand down into 16 segments per second. Kind of gives it that smooth-looking appearance. you got sti- titanium and steel cases available. Then, of course, you have that Accutron, the high-end without the high price. These things started under $600. 
So it's not like it's completely out of the realm of possibility. Maybe you're a gadget guy. You like that Citizen stuff. The Citizen has the perfect watch for the gadget guy. You've got a timer for your barbecue, multiple timers along with alarms, all of this stuff so you're not sleeping through your turn-ins. And then that cottage watchmaker that lives right here on the west side of Cleveland, Philip, Philip and Company Watches, starting at only $895. And all these watches are serial numbered and registered with Philip himself. So here's what you're going to have to do. You go to stephendefranco.com first and foremost. Then you pick out a new watch. Thirdly, you call Steve and you ask for him directly. 440-943-2700. 440-943-2700. You tell him you're a barbecue brother or sister, and he will give you the real discounted price of the watch on the phone because, by law, he's technically not allowed to do it on the website. It has something to do with manufacturers or something like that. So, again, stephendefranco.com first. Pick out the watch second. Then you call Steve, 440 943 2700 and then and only then will Steve give you that real price that he wants to give you. It's not going to be prohibited by manufacturer at that point. As always, Steve will ship you the watch for free, so that'll save you some money too, especially if you're out of town. Again, stephendefranco.com. All right, when we come back, it will be Sean Rice Meet Me. Go to the website right now, check him out meetmeblog.blogspot. Com. Sean, how about buying web space instead of uh, freeloading for Christ's sake? All right, you're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show right here on the Barbecue Central Radio Networks. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, uh, we are back. I apologize, running into a little technical difficulty. Wrote the uh, number down. Uh, wrote the number down wrong, I believe, for uh, Sean. Not good. He'll be calling in here in a second. He's in the chat room, I believe. I could also probably look him up. Uh, Sean Rice. Or you could just call in, Sean. Very simple. Uh. Summary on the show, Sean. Let's see. Oh, boy. Oh, this is terrible. Sean, call in, buddy. While he's... Oh, man, what did I do with that number? Oh. Did I save it? Probably trashed it. Let's see. Uh, so while we're waiting, let's do this. Are you a pit master? Well, I'll take this together. Move it over here. All right, so let's take a look at this real quick. I don't know if anybody took this or not, but it's called uh, Barbecue Trivia. Uh, trivia, are you a barbecue pit master? So here's what we're going to do. I saw him in there. It says, meet me. He's probably checked out. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here we go. I see I see my error. I do see my error now, which is good. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, race over to that line here. Quickly. 
and pull up Sean Ross. Sean, how are you, bud? Good. How are you doing? Doing absolutely fabulous, Sean. I uh, apologize. I, I know what I did wrong. I used a area code that was very similar to the one in here in Cleveland. And that's where we are. I apologize. Not a problem. But now we're off and running. All right, Sean. Um, so we have a couple different things that we can talk about tonight. But first, for the people that aren't as familiar with the Meet Me blog, if you could tell us you know, a little bit about yourself and why you thought it would be the best idea ever to start meetmeblog.blogspot.com. Well, basically, I had been uh, posting pictures of food, uh, you know, everything from barbecuing to dinners I'd been to, to, you know, burgers made out of bacon with bacon on top, you know, on Facebook, and people had always been making fun of me, and, you know, and they're like, uh, you know, you know, all you do is talk about food, right? And I said, yeah. So basically, my girlfriend kind of came up with the idea of, uh, or my ex-girlfriend, actually, of uh, doing a blog about Uh-oh. food. And she's like, why don't you call it Eat Me? And I'm like, oh, mm, it's not really my thing, but I love the meat stuff, though. So, you know, just started doing that and uh, started, started off doing, like, restaurant reviews, uh, going around to different places, checking them out. And it was more about, like, the experiences. And then uh, people started asking me where I got my meat from. And, you know, I had no idea. So I basically uh, went up to Chico, California. I met with some uh, cattle producers, custom exempt butchers, you know, things like that, and kind of figured out and did actually a four-part series called uh, Mood of Mouth, Meet a True Love Story for Valentine's Day on where meat comes from where, where you know the stuff you get in the store all the way to you know people that actually buy off the western video market um you know and get stuff sold into costco things like that and then uh decided to take my uh show on the road and go and check out different places uh in new orleans and just kind of i think overall just travel around the u.s and find out who has the best barbecue and, and food and meat um you know and just kind of share that experience with everybody is it a f- and then uh, you know is it- is it a food what? blog that is also focused on barbecue, or is it a barbecue blog that is also focused on other food? It's see, it's a it's a it's a meat blog about meat, but they you know there's definitely a big emphasis on barbecue because you know without meat you wouldn't have barbecue, and without barbecue you wouldn't have meat. Correct. Uh, Sean Rice is our guest. Meetmeblog.blogspot.com is the website. If you want to check him out, also on Twitter at meetmeblog. If you want to tweet at him. So you'd mentioned that you were down in New Orleans. It was like a seven day, or you visited uh, seven restaurants. You also visited a butcher. I'm sure it was like yeah, a you know a wonderful type deal for you. Can you give us a little recap of you know what your takeaway was? Yeah, it was basically five days, two restaurants a day, uh, lunch and dinner, wow. and probably gained about twenty pounds while I was out there. But uh, I basically hit up um, you know people that I got a hold of on Twitter that wanted me to come out and check out their stuff. Um, I got through Squeal Barbecue, uh, McClure's Barbecue, which is basically like a pop-up shop at another restaurant that wasn't open for lunch. Um, then there was uh, Cochon Butcher, which is a butcher shop. It has a whole bunch of different uh, like stuff that they, little, that they have that they've aged for for over a year. And that they basically have like a big party when they break it out of the, of the freezer. Um, you had that. You also had uh, this place called Toops Meadery that literally opened about five days before uh, I arrived. And they were doing different types of meat platters, everything from sheep neck to duck gizzards to uh, this thing they have called chicken jelly. And it was literally like a, a bowl of chicken soup on top of a piece of sourdough once you spread it out. It's pretty amazing. And then uh, every single place I had been to it asked me if I hit up the joint yet. Uh, and so finally I was able to get a hold of the guy and went down there and He's got a pretty big setup, and he's just really, really laid back, really chill. He moves about five miles an hour, and uh, or as fast as his smoker. <laughs> and uh, but I mean, the food was amazing the entire time I was there. And then I, the last place was uh, Felix's Oyster Bar uh, and restaurant, where it was basically uh, run by a bunch of mobsters. And then uh, ended up uh, uh, the guy who was asking me, Kennedy, worked there as a busboy. So there's a whole bunch of you know, controversy shrouded in that place. And then uh, and then I finished with the uh, Two Run Farms, which isn't up yet. Um, and they basically uh, are, uh, they raise cattle, uh, cows and sheep, and they slaughter them up um, in a style of kosher and deliver to local restaurants and actually deliver, hand deliver them to uh, the head chefs. And I went on a, a delivery run with them and it really gives the, the chef an opportunity to talk to him about you know, how they like to meet with the more back fat or, you know, whatever it is that they're into exactly. 
Now, you had mentioned a couple sentences ago something about sheep neck. Did you enjoy this delicacy, sheep neck? I tried it. I had <laughs> the place that I had gone to before I went before I arrived there at Toops uh, had a lot <laughs> had fed the crap out of me, so I really didn't get a chance to try a bunch of stuff there. But the the sheep neck, from what I saw, and there was actually another blogger that was there eating it, I just thought it was oh. unbelievable, and thought thought it was just the most the tenderest piece of meat he had had, um, you know, from sheep. Now, uh, after you were able to, eva- you know, you step back, you evaluate all the food that you've crammed down your gullet. Was there one that kind of reigned supreme and gained the people's fame and adulation forever? Uh, the the tube meter, I must say. The, the, the chef that was there had studied under a whole bunch of other master chefs out there for about 15 years and finally decided to open up his own place and just do meat. And he didn't want to do anything else. I mean, that's literally, they have a, a few salads on there and, and a few other things, but you know, his thing was all meat, different cuts of meat was basically being able to take like an entire animal and, and serve it up. You know, you know, they had, I mean, they even had a, a faux gras and a jelly there. I mean, it was just, I, the stuff he was doing was just amazing. I, I think for ingenuity in what he was doing it was definitely by far different and more advanced than what everybody else was doing. You know, it, it I think a certain type of people will appreciate it. I don't know that everybody will. You know, I, I can't imagine my mom eating duck gizzard, but, you know, who knows? Sean Rice joining us on the show. Uh, Meetmeblog.blogspot.com is his website. Sean, you're a West Coast guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, born and raised in the Valley. All right, so let me ask you this question, completely off topic. You didn't even, uh, we didn't even talk about this, but I'm just remembering this from another show that I watch. California if not right now, currently, uh, or like maybe July 1st, whatever, is going to be under a fagua br- uh, ban. You're no longer allowed to eat fagua or fragua in California at all. What the hell is going on over there? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think the funny thing is this, everybody thinks of most of California is all farmers, but everybody thinks of California as Los Angeles. So it's really centered around the city with everybody with tons of money, <laughs> you know, we have a huge economy out here, and everybody thinks that it's all about, you know, cr- you ca- kindness to animals. Everybody wants to be kind to animals. You know, the, you know, you get a, the, the, the animal activists that are out here and, and all that stuff, and I think it's just them kind of pushing it on the, you know, the people with, you know, that are <laughs> doing this and getting them to stop doing it, you know. But, I mean, you know, it's interesting to me that these people do these things because you see people post these, like, anti-meat things on Facebook, and it drives me crazy because then some company reacts based on something someone posted on Facebook, and next thing you know, hundreds of people are out of jobs, and it's just it's a, it's a sad way to try and get a point across. There's nothing that has been proven in foie gras that is going to lead you to a heart attack quicker. It's going to make you bleed out of your eyeballs or uh, bleed out of your anus or anything like that, right? No, no, no. Duck liver, is, uh, it might even be good for you. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but it certainly feels good going in your mouth. All right. Well, uh, just one of those things that I remember hearing, so I figured I'd uh, get your take on that. Uh, something else that is happening, uh, very first part, I believe this is, is it June 9th and 10th or July 9th and 10th, uh, which is the OC Barbecue it, Competition? Yeah, it actually is uh, June 9th and 10th. Okay, so that'll be uh, this weekend. weekend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's actually currently up on the blog right now. Um, it's to benefit the Christie's Foundation. The entire event, they're actually having, they have 72 barbecue, uh, barbecue teams competing, which I believe is uh, for, I don't know, I think she was saying for the state of California was the most uh, competitors they had ever had at one, one event. I'm actually doing a uh, TV thing for Good Morning America, or Good, Good Morning LA on uh, Channel 11 out here uh, for... The, uh, they actually have a Mr. Barbecue pageant where you go in and you talk about how barbecue is going to change the world and, you know, what, what you believe is your, what you can do with barbecue and you kind of go up there and everybody competes and there's, you know, you get like a, a sash and a crown, I believe. Um, and it's actually a great event. And, you know, the crowd loves it. They get really excited about the whole thing. I assume you're going to be wearing your hot dog outfit, right? To everybody, but what a big wiener you are. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Apparently, I'm really creepy without it. So, from what the way people react at these events, where I'm taking, you know, when some random guy with a big giant beard is taking pictures of you, you kind of get a little uncomfortable. But if he's in a hot dog suit, hey, 
you might want a picture with him. It's yeah. awkward, but it works for people. Absolutely. So, uh, and let's not step over the fact that Christie's Foundation, uh, I've actually had uh, Christie's Foundation on uh, over the past uh, couple years kind of promoting the event. But again, it's going to be this weekend. For the people that aren't familiar with Christie's Foundation, this is something that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but they're really providing one of the great and at the same time most tragic services, which is end-of-life care for terminally ill young folks. So it, it's sad, but the service that they're providing is really second to none. Yeah, and, and, and at this particular event, I'm actually doing it through the kids' eyes. There's, there's a kid that gets partnered up with each team, and I'm going to basically feature, try and feature as many kids as I can on the blog next week. I'm there for all three days, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and just trying to get you know as many of these kids up there and get the attention and you know just trying to get really get people to donate i think is, is really the key and, and get them the, you know the attention that they need john rice joining us here on the show again the website meetmeblog.blogspot.com when you go and you see i mean you're taking the pictures right sean yes that is correct all right so obviously you have you know an eye for photography you obviously probably have more than the standard you know, Nikon piece of crap thing that slides in your uh, pants pocket for camera taking. For the people that want to kind of step up their photography game without having to invest, you know, in a, a D900 or, you know, some type of huge camera body with associated lenses, you know, are there some things that you can just get right out there uh, to the central lights tonight in regards to helping them take kind of better crisper pictures? Because yours are like second to none. They are completely awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm using a Canon 5D actually. You know, I, and I wish more of my stuff was in focus. I'm kind of crazy about that stuff. But uh, you know, in terms of like a something small, handheld, you know, under 300 bucks, there's the I have a little pocket uh, digital Elf that Canon makes. Um, you know, I think it's I don't know, 16, 17, 18 megapixels or something like that. But it does video. It does slow motion video. Um, it does H, you know HD video. It also does the stills. It's great. It's under 300 bucks, and I. I go through about two of these things a year. I mean, just getting trashed and you take them on fishing trips and run around barbecue competitions with them in my pocket. But it's just nice to kind of get, you know, a nice quick video that I can take, you know, that's really easy to edit and, you know, the stuff's really easy to transfer to my computer when I get home and slap it on out there. Are, are you spending a lot of time on, like, Photoshop or something like that to doctor them up, or are they coming out that good? Yeah, I do. I mean, I I use Lightroom primarily. I mean, I bring I bring the shots in, I upload them, I I adjust them in Lightroom and do whatever. Because I'm actually uh, for a living, I do a lot of retouching and digital composite art. You know, I primarily do most of the covers and feature stories for Car and Driver. But uh, you know, so I kind of sit there and spend the time and make the pictures look good. And then uh, the writing is not so great. <laughs> I actually uh, I actually have uh, Tom Emery's daughter, Katie. Or Kathy, or, or Katie, I think it is Katie Emery, uh, editing my writing as <laughs> when I'm done with it because I'm, I'm I'm not that great at the English portion of this thing. So turning this into a video uh, someday, with, you know, getting the extra help to do it would would be ideal. Sean Rice joining us here on the show. Sean, uh, one more thought before I let you go, kind of like uh, current food news to hit up. I don't know if you saw, it, but Burger King was testing the bacon Sunday and bacon flavored soda. And a turkey and gravy flavor. What? What are we coming to as a society where bacon and gravy are infiltrating like Burger Kings and fast food? <laughs> I love the bacon, the bacon craze. I absolutely think it's fantastic. Apparently, I don't know. They had what the the bacon shake that did really, really. Well. I have actually tried it, but I do like that they're that people are going. You know, I have this idea actually for for doing clothing and and uh, and, and like sheets and, and pillows. In bacon or you know pepperoni or different types of meat, I think that would always be fun to have around the house. But you know, when I do try, I actually did try the uh, the nacho burrito today, and I must say, I'm from Taco Bell, and that was not very delicious. It looks pretty on uh, TV, but it's not something you want in your stomach. Can can something be delicious if you're tipping the price scales at you what a buck ten, a buck forty nine? Typically, those two don't go hand in hand, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> you might as well just eat the dollar bill if you're really going to go that low. Yeah, I mean, at least you're getting some uh, a semblance of real fiber in your diet at that point. Uh, Sean Rice talking to us here. Uh, one more thing before I let you go. There was a cow crashing party. 
that I saw, and I think you probably saw it too, where like these cows came in to like a, a party and like started taking over and taking people's beer. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because one of the one of the things I think that that I mean they could be onto something if you think about it. Most people like to inject their meat. Why not have the cow start drinking before you even kill it? I mean, if you think about it that way, you might be getting a little bit better of a flavor if you just have him ingest the stuff himself rather than having to do it yourself. Yeah, it's almost like you are doing Kobe beef here in America. You're giving the beer. I mean, minus the fact that you're not massaging them and all that stuff. But, hey, if the uh, people that they're busting in on are a little intoxicated and the cows are coming in and they're having a few, I mean, who knows what can happen at that point, right? Could be yeah, some massaging. Or, after they're drunk. I mean, yeah. think about it. Right. You could just carve them right up, throw them right on the grill. Perfect. I'm Absolutely. there. Yeah, why not? So you cooking? I'm coming. <laughs> hey, well, if there were any cows here in the city, I would certainly uh, get my fair share to slaughter. Uh, Sean Rice joining us here on the show again. Meetmeblog.blogspot.com is his website. Sean, appreciate the time tonight. We'll do it again soon. Greg, it's been a blast. I love it. All right, you got it. Take care. There he is. Sean Rice. Meetme.blogspot.com. What is this? Chip. chip. This is a potato chip. So, oh. man, you can't just have one. Get that big stuff out of here. Larry Bird's a liar. Get that big <laughs> stuff out of here. There is video of cows crashing a party and drinking beer. Go find it on the Internet. Did you hear? Oh, I better I better save that. Don't forget, coming up in about 20 minutes from now, we are going to be giving away a three-piece set of Easy Hooks from the good folks over at Easy Hooks. And, of course, the tagline, which I consistently find to be one of the coolest ever, if you're hooking, you're not cooking unless you're hooking. And no, that doesn't mean you have to live in Las Vegas. What? Gang, a few minutes of your time to talk about the longest-running sponsor of the show, the Barbecue Guru. Now, look, I've talked about automatic pit temperature control literally for years. They've been the longest-running sponsor of the show. What I find refreshing about a company like the uh, Barbecue Guru is the fact that, you know, they're not making just one product, right? You have a number of different automatic pit temperature control devices to choose from. But they're consistently pushing the edge of technology. What do I mean by that? I mean, right now, if you're somebody that cooks in the backyard, if you are a competition cook, maybe you're a caterer, maybe you're a technology geek, you meld those all in together, and they spit out, boom, barbecue or the CyberQ Wi-Fi. So here's what the deal is. Maybe you have a home Wi-Fi internet connection. Maybe you're at a barbecue competition that has Wi-Fi access. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the CyberQ actually can generate its own Wi-Fi signal if you have to. Maybe you have a smartphone. Maybe you have an iPad. Maybe you have a netbook of some sort or a laptop. If it can connect to a Wi-Fi, you're going to be able to launch a web page and see where the CyberQ Wi-Fi unit is cooking, what the temperature is, your uh, meat probes. It will show you exactly where your meat is temperature-wise internally. So maybe you're cooking a little bit slow. No problem. Middle of the night, you're in a competition trailer, or you're at home doing an overnight cook and you're in your bed. And you're like, damn, I don't want to get out of bed and go check thermometers. I'm just going to pull up my smartphone. Boop, boop, two punches, boom, launches the web page. You can see exactly where your temperatures are at. And it's brought to you all by the great folks over at the Barbecue Guru. Now, $295 is where that price starts and includes everything. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns... Feel free to call them first, 800-288-GURU. That's 800-288-GURU. You're going to be able to talk to maybe Bob Trudnack himself or one of the other many knowledgeable people over at the Barbecue Guru. They'll make sure you're outfitted, ready to go, right out of the box. Ships promptly, and they have customer service after the fact. So if you get it and you realize, oh, crap, I don't know how to figure it out or I'm having trouble installing it, whatever the case may be, you are going to be able to call them, and they will take care of you right off the bat. So, 800-288-GURU, or you can visit them online, thebbqguru.com. Two ways to find them. Again, good folks at the Barbecue Guru, 
the barbecue guru, a breakthrough in barbecue technology. We're going to change it up, talk some offset pit maintenance coming up here in just a minute. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show right here on the Barbecue Central Radio Networks. Get in the smoke. Call 877-448-0433 to get on the air. Now, here's your host, Greg Rampey. Big B, Moonshine Band, Suburban Respecter. Let's go! All right, 37 past the hour, 877-448-0433, Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. My next guest has been on the show before, like way back when it was just a podcast. Every once in a while, I reference those Baker Dozens podcasts that have never seen the light of Internet, mostly because I was horrible. However, this guy was a part of one of those original shows, and he's here to talk some offset barbecue pit maintenance. We raced over the hotline. Owner of Gator Pit in Houston, Texas, Richie Robin. Rich, how are you, buddy? I'm doing fine, Greg. How you doing? Doing absolutely good, good to be back. Oh man, it's been li- literally years since we did that uh, first podcast. A lot of things have changed, namely the fact that Gator Pit has continued to grow and be a preeminent offset pit manufacturer, aside from a number of other things. So maybe that's where we should start, Rich. For the people that aren't familiar with Gator Pit, or perhaps they've heard, you know, in the uh, annals of offset pit making. Gator Pit, this manufacturer, that manufacturer. A little history about you know yourself. You were in law enforcement prior to getting into this whole thing. Why'd you make that jump, and where did you find this uh, passion for barbecue? Um, I started welding back when I was 14 years old, and uh, I was in FFA in high school. Uh, I enjoyed it. I loved it. And for four years, I welded the barbecue pits, and we sold them at the high school to make money for the high school. Um, and, and it just it kind of went from there. I graduated high school, went to college, uh, actually uh, uh, graduated uh, around 89, or at, in 89, December of 89, and moved to Texas to actually go to law school, and decided I didn't want to be a lawyer, so what do you do with a degree in legal studies? So uh, uh, went to uh, just went to law enforcement. Uh, now, I did things prior to that, too. I was also in the Army. I was in engineering school and uh, graduated there as well in engineering school at Fort McCullen, Alabama, and uh, also at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, uh, where I graduated there as well. Um, but all that was in, in, in lines with, with what led me to where I'm at now. Uh, I did my, my law enforcement for, for a number of years and uh, just went back to what I loved doing, and that was uh, welding. And, and I went back to what I was doing in high school at, 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 in the early 90s. And uh, here, here I am now. Uh, the company's grown. Uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I uh, look forward to continued uh, success and, and getting people some gator pits out there, man, so they know what some real smokers are and what real pits are. Absolutely. Rich Robin joining us here on the show. The website, by the way, if you want to check out his products, gatorpit.net. That's gatorpit.net. You are a custom builder. Do you have, like, stock models that you can kind of look at first and then option out from there as far as customizations, or how, how do you typically work that? Yeah, well, typically what my customers do, Greg, is they'll go on my website, they'll look at standard designs that I've come up with over 21 years of doing this uh, uh, since the early 90s, and we, we put uh, good models out there, uh, popular models, what people like. They take that design, and what they do is they build to that. So they'll take, a, 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 a say, a, a, a party getter model that I have, which is my most popular pit. Uh, it's the one that I have the most sales on, the most, uh, the, the greatest number of orders on right now. And they'll build to it, and, and they make it unique to themselves. Uh, we'll customize it based on what they want. And that's the good thing about Gator Pit is you're going to get what you want. And the end result is you get what you want. You're not selling for a store-bought retail, uh, retail-type pit. And, uh, you know, it, uh, honestly, it's going to cost you a little more. But you're going to buy a pit that's going to last you a lifetime. You're going to pass it on to your kids, your grandkids. Uh, and, and it's going to just be family fun for, for, forever. Uh, you know, they're warranted for a lifetime. And uh, we can only do that because we know we, we turn on a good product. Rich Robin joining us here on the show. All right, Rich, so let's say I have one. This is what we wanted to talk to you about tonight. I was getting a lot of questions about offset pit maintenance and things that you need to do to make sure that you're keeping them in, in proper running order. You know, once I get it from Houston here to Cleveland, you always hear people, you got to season the pit, you got to do a burn-in to, you know, eliminate any chemicals or blah, 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 or whatever the case may be. So when you get that first pit going, what's the best way to break it in? 
Okay. <clears throat> Gator pits are all made with new steel. I want to first emphasize that. We don't use any used, used, used materials whatsoever in the manufacturing of our products. All brand new pipe, uh, all brand new structural steel. So what, what's in there in the steel is, going to, is coming directly from the manufacturer, uh, the steel company. So typically what you do when you, when you buy a cooker is you're going to oil it down with some cooking oil. You can use peanut oil, canola oil. They have a high viscosity of heat. They, uh, uh, you can use, if, if you want, you can go to Walmart and buy the great value cheap oil because what you're going to do is, is you're coating the interior of the pit with it. You want to fill the pores up with the cooking oil. You want to put a small fire in the firebox, and you want to gradually work it up to temperature because you've got a brand-new pit. It's a virgin pit. Uh, you're going to have expansion and contraction of the steel. You've got to break it in a little bit, so to speak. And you also want to season it so that uh, you, you do burn, uh, Greg, as you said, the oils that are used in the manufacturing of the cutting and all that, uh, not only from the mill that it comes from, but just also from us working in it and, and doing what we do to turn that raw steel into a barbecue pit. So you need to burn that out. There's nothing in our in, in, in gator pits that is going to hurt you if you don't do that and you put your meat on it immediately. But you're going to want to season it first because if you don't, you're going to be evaporating those oils and all that. They come from the mills that is going to boil out of the out of the steel, out of the pores. You know, and it's just going to make for your meat the first time you cook on it. It's just not going to taste that great. So you season it, you burn that out, you replace that with good cooking oil uh, that soaks into the pores. And the more you cook on the pits, the better the cooking gets. Uh, and and it, it's really so. It's that simple. Rich Robin it's joining like seasoning us. Seasoning a cast iron pot or a cast iron skillet. If anyone's familiar with doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing. And you don't ever strip it down to, to to the bare metal after you cook on it. Nor nor would you do that to a cast iron pot or skillet. You 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 rinse it out with soap and water. Uh, as far as a cast iron pot, you do the same thing with a pit. You leave the seasoning in there. You don't want to strip it. You never never want to strip it down to the bare metal again. Because if you do, then you got to reseason it again. So you just want to keep the oils in there. You want to keep the meat juices on the grates. All that helps season the pit. It minimizes the rusting on the interior, especially in dry climates where you have no humidity, uh, and, 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 and you don't want the pit to, the pit to rust. The outside, <clears throat> if I'm jumping the gun, Greg, tell me. I'll stop. Um, but the outside, you want to coat that as well. And believe it or not, you're gonna, people are going to say, I can't believe you just said this. Take the outside of your pit and squirt it with WD-40, Coat it down with WD-40 and spread it out with a cotton cloth rag and, and lubricate the exterior of the pit. Not the inside. I want to emphasize, not the inside of the pit. That's cooking oil. There is there is a difference. But the outside, the reason I recommend DW-40 is because it's not oily and it's also a lubricant. Water that hits it, it's going to roll off of it like, like water on a duck's back. Uh, it's going to lubricate your hinges, uh, and it's, it, it's not going to track pollen and dust and all that and, and get nasty. If you if you want to, you can use cooking oil to do that, but keep in mind you better build a fire into it and you better burn it a few times to dry that cooking oil on the outside. Because if you don't, you will get the dust and the pollen and everything else that's outside floating around in the wind. That's going to stick to your pit, and when you fire it up, it's going to stay in that pit because it's, it's baking in that oil. Rich Robin <laughs> joining us here on the show. We're talking about some offset pit maintenance. But let me ask you about this. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, I have one. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of climate change here in Cleveland, so we're getting, you know, winter, spring, fall, all this stuff. So there's constant uh, expansion, contraction of the metal. Maybe I'm not going to use it as much during the winter time as I would, you know, during the warmer months because I'm going to be having to tend to fire with the offset pits. So let's say I get some rust on the outside of the firebox, not necessarily the main chamber, but obviously there's going to be a little bit more uh, uh, apt to, to rust the firebox because it's the hottest part of the pit. How do I want to take right. care of that rust properly, and is it something that you're just going to constantly contend with? Do you not even want to consider you know, repainting over it after it uh, chips off the first time? Okay. <clears throat> What's going to happen on that is the firebox is going to be the first place that's going to show exactly what you're talking about, Greg. And it's not that the paint, if, if the manufacturer is using a high-heat barbecue black paint or a high-heat paint, it's not that the paint can't handle it, the, the, the heat. Uh, we use a 1,000 degree Rust-Oleum brand paint. Uh, it can handle up to 1,000 degrees. But like you mentioned earlier, you have expansion and contraction of the steel. A newer pit is going to expand and contract quicker uh, until it, it actually starts to break in after several cooks. So the expanding contraction is going to be minimized. So if you want to wait and cook on your pit, give it about six months of breaking in period. Then you can come back and touch up that paint, and you're going to do it less frequently than if you start from the get-go and say after the third cook, some of your paint came off the firebox, and typically it's going to be at the, at the very top. 
because that is the greatest expansion area is the, is the center of the firebox at the top. Uh, and that's going to be in a square box or a pipe box. It doesn't matter. That's where the heat's most concentrated, is dead center of, of the top of the firebox. Give it a little while, then come back and get you a little light sanding, uh, sanding disc, get your wire wheel on a, uh, a, a grinder, and then just, just take off the surface rust. If you do it and you don't let the, the pit get too bad with the surface rust, you can actually just take it off with the, with the pressure sprayer if you have a pressure sprayer. Soap and water knocks it right off of the pressure sprayer. Then you come back and you can use a little acetone and take off the remaining surface rust and any grease that's on there with some acetone. And as soon as you do that, come back and hit it again with your high heat uh, paint. If you, if you happen to have a compressor and a sprayer, that's the best way to do it. If not, you can buy aerosol type uh, uh, high heat black. Uh, Rust-Oleum brand, Krylon, you have several manufacturers out there, Stove Paint, they have several manufacturers out there that you can buy in an aerosol spray can if you don't have the convenience of a car sprayer or a compressor to do it. So there's ways, and you can roll it on as well. I would recommend a, a sponge roller, not a paintbrush, but a sponge roller. Uh, it comes out smoother, it doesn't have the brush marks in it, uh, and again, it's a, it's a sponge roller that you can use to do that. Uh, that's going to put it on a little thicker coat, but you want to do multiple layers. If you don't do multiple layers, then you're defeating the purpose and you're just wasting your time. You want to be patient, uh, uh, get the surface rust off, degrease it, and then hit it immediately with your paint, your new paint. All right, Rich, uh, let me ask you this question, too, because every once in a while I've seen, and I had it happen uh, with my offset pit when I had it, there was a little bit of rust uh, at the bottom of the pipe on the inside, so... Is it a, I'm sure it's not a similar process, you're not going to be repainting the inside, but there has to be a way for you to kind of get away at that rust and then kind of re-season the inside as well. Right. Well, what you're going to do is you don't want to put cooking oil on the inside or season the inside of your firebox, okay? That's a whole different different uh, chamber than what your food chamber, your smoke chamber is where your meat goes. <clears throat> Two separate boxes. So if you have that buildup, a lot of that is just smoke residue. Believe it or not, it, it's not rust. Uh, it. it, it it could be, just depending on, on whether or not you're maintaining that box after each cook. One of the worst things you can do to a barbecue pit, and it doesn't matter gator pit or who manufactured it, the worst thing to do is to leave ash, burnt ash, down into the bottom of the firebox. Because what happens is that ash accumulates in all the corners of the firebox. Square fireboxes require a little more TLC to maintain and add longevity because you have all the corners at the base and it's a flat surface at the bottom. That ash gets in all those corners and, and it's hard to get out. Uh, and what happens is ash will attract humidity, morning dew, it gets wet, and when ash gets wet, it gets extremely acidic. So what that does is it starts eating at the walls and the wells of the pit. So you know, the pipe boxes, fire boxes, pros and cons, pipe box, less maintenance, it's going to last you a little longer. Uh, if, you, if you keep it cleaned out and you maintain the pipe box, you should never have to replace a pipe box. The square fire boxes are going to require a little more maintenance, but again, you shouldn't replace the, pipe, the square fire box either if, if you give a little more TLC to it and keep it cleaned out. So the ash is extremely acidic when it attracts morning moisture. Uh, and most people, to be honest, they don't clean the fire boxes out until they're cooking on it again the next month or the next two weeks. Hmm. So during that week or that four weeks, it's just sitting there tearing that fire box up. It's a cancer in the fire box, which is what you don't want in your pit. So your fireboxes aren't burning out, guys. What they're doing is they're rusting out, and they're getting eaten up by the acidity of the ash. Rich Robin joining us here on the show. Again, the website, gatorpit.net, if you want to go ahead and, uh, A, take a look, and then potentially place an order. Uh, for the folks that take a look and then decide that they want to go with the Gator Pit, Rich, what's your turnaround time right now? Right now, <laughs> we're 8 to 12 weeks on orders. Wow. So it's yeah, almost like it was a couple of years ago when it was like really picking up. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've been doing really well. Uh, we're shipping pits now worldwide. We're taking on a lot of custom orders. Uh, we've got pits going to Scotland, Hong Kong, Russia. Uh, we are shipping literally worldwide right now. Uh, we've really, really, uh, have, have grown over the, the past few years. Uh, the quality of our pits is, is known worldwide now and, and, and people are willing to wait for the quality. And, uh, if you're willing to wait and you want a quality pit, a pit that you never got to replace, never got to buy, you know, uh, again, and pass it on to your kids and your grandkids. Get a Gator Pit. We're not a retail. We're not a retail store. We don't manufacture our barbecue pits. They're made by hand. They're made one at a time. At one one at one at a time, and, uh, and that's the only way you can maintain quality. Uh, it's myself and my wife that runs the company, and I've got seven welders in my shop, 
and we work uh, five to seven days a week in, in production. And uh, that's that's the best we can do. I can hire more welders, but the problem with hiring more welders is the quality goes goes downhill. Uh, I inspect every pit that goes out of my shop. Nothing leaves my shop without me personally inspecting it. Uh, again, it goes back to me holding my, my quality uh, of, of standard with my products. Uh, and, and if we mass produced, you lose it. You might as well be buying pits from Academy Lowe's or somewhere else. And that's what you get. And, and you're not going to get that from Gator Pit. Absolutely. Rich Robin, again, joining us here on the show, owner of Gator Pit. And again, the website Gator Pit. Dot net. Have a look at that. Rich, appreciate you coming on, kind of breaking down that offset pit maintenance. Let's do it again. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry. What, Greg? I said thanks for coming on tonight and talking about pit maintenance. Oh, Let's do it again soon. Man, you got it. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on here again, Greg. All right, Rich, and, take uh, care. Continue, continue your success as well. I, thank you. I appreciate it. Talk to you I soon, buddy. It, I really... There he is, Rich Robin, GatorPit.net. Check him out. And I remember back in the day, it was like Gator Pit v. Close and Who's got the better pit? And one faction over here, the other faction over here. I was mediating in between fisticuffs. Both continue to grow and do very well. Rich Robin, Houston, Texas, GatorPit.net. Check it out. If you want, a, if you want an offset pit, that is definitely a manufacturer to check out. Very passionate, that young man. All right, gang. Here we go. If you're like me, always trying to think of ways to step up the barbecue game doesn't matter if you're a competitor. Maybe you're just a backyard hack like me. Quick, easy way to do it. Butcher Barbecue. That's the one I was looking for. Now, look, I'm not going to sit here and bore you with validation on why you should go to Butcher Barbecue. You've heard me talk about them for months, maybe even a year now. Dave Bosco is putting out some of the most well-respected quality products on the market today. And, again, on all levels. Competition people use it. Backyard people use it. And it is to rave reviews. And we all know that Butchers is well known for the injections, the pork, the beef. Of course, now they have that prime injection, which has combined all the things loved with their beef injection. And they use its award-winning flavor enhancer and its ability to keep the brisket juicy. They've also combined it with what has become the competition standard in beef flavor. And it's available for sale right now at ButcherBBQ.com. Now, maybe you're looking for a new rub. Maybe you're looking for a new sauce. You don't have to look anywhere else except a little bit further on that website. They have the steak and brisket rub. They have the honey rub. They have the premium rub, which you really want to consider if you're using the butcher's injection, specially formulated to work hand-in-hand rub and injection. It's a perfect one-two punch to impress the judges and the friends alike. Last but not least, gang. Best sauce on the market, the sweet barbecue sauce. Look, when it comes to sauce, you've heard me review as others here on the show. I'm as picky as it gets. Butcher's Barbecue Sweet Sauce wins for me in every category, every time. Not overly sweet. It's got some nice back-end heat. It's got a nice little tang. All of the stuff that I look for in a quality sauce, and that's why I have it stocked here in my house. I'm not kidding. I buy by the box of six because it will go fast. I recommend that you buy by the box of six as well. It will go fast, and everybody in the house will love it. No worries on breaking the bank when it comes to shipping either. Orders at $55 or less. Ship at $7 U.S. dollars, $56 and up. Ship at 9 bucks. It's cheap either way. Head on over to ButcherBBQ.com. Stock up now. The rubs, the sauces, the injections, the grill, which is a marinade or an injection, or you can use it both ways if you want to at the same time. Butcher's Barbecue. Always trust your butcher. We're going to uh, wrap up the first hour, and we'll point towards Meathead after this. We'll give away those meat hooks, the easy hooks. Stick around. We'll be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs. And the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue, it's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, coming up on four till the hour. Trying to figure out what I want to do here. All right, uh, first one in to call in uh, gets the easy hooks, 877-448-0433. Hurry. Hurry, hurry, before the top of the hour comes in. 
877-448-0433. Thanks to Rich Robin talking some offset pit maintenance. Thanks to Sean Rice, meetmeblog.blogspot.com. Uh, let's go to area code 410, name and where you're calling from. Uh, David Haber from Seagull, Maryland. David, how are you, buddy? Good, how are you? Doing absolutely fabulous, David. Uh, you are first in. You want the easy hooks? Oh, I'd love it. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, so here's what you want to do. Send me an email, greg at the com. Give me your shipping address. I'll forward that on to uh, Marsha Fox and the good folks over at Easy Hooks. Also, let me know if you're left or right-handed, and uh, we'll go ahead and get you hooked right up. Greg, I appreciate it. really love the show. All right. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening. And a winner just like that. All right. Stop calling. That's it. Next week. Try it again next week. We'll try it again next week. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, let's see. Where did it go? And I just had it. Damn it. All right, so again, uh, thanks to Sean Rice. Again, his website, meetme.blogspot.com. Fabulous photos. Fabulous. Jealous photos, I hate to say. Because I'm kind of like a, a picture guy in the closet. I'm an in-the-closet picture guy. <laughs> also, uh, thanks to Rich Robin taking time out of his busy schedule. 8 to 12 weeks if you want a custom gator pit now. Check that out. Uh, we will step away, and then we will reload for the second hour. Coming up, second takes. We have Meathead for two segments. We're going to be talking about a number of items. We're going to revisit the barbecue versus grilling thing. We're going to talk about spritzing, potentially. We'll talk about the Barbecue Hall of Fame. We'll talk about Barbecue Pitmasters, a veritable cornucopia of stuff. Meathead can somehow possibly stay somewhat so. I doubt it. It's asking a lot. All right, I'll step away. I'm going to rewater. And uh, we'll hit the second hour. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show right here on the Barbecue Central Radio Networks. I'm Johnny Dam, host of the Damage Report radio show. When I'm not falling in love with the First Amendment all over again, I like to sit back, relax, and rub my meat to the Barbecue Central show. And now your host, Greg Rempe. Go, Greg. Yeah, rub that meat. From my heart and from my hand, why don't people understand my intention? Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Fine, how's it going? <laughs> you have a great show, I'm a big fan. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish, what? He ate 54 wieners. Listen, Lavernius, shake I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seeds. <laughs> you could use it to fight off creeping marauders looking to take your steaks off your grills. I just like being anywhere with Junior, Senior, and Diva. Sounds like a whole type of movie. <laughs> wow, yeah, really. <laughs> keep it hot, keep it clean, keep it lubricated. We have top men working on it right now. Ooh, top men. And just like that, we are into the second hour, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Keep it loose. I'm working on Mr. Keep It Hot, Keep It Clean, Keep It Lubricated, Stephen Reich. His uh, personal assistant lives in Cleveland. Why is she my personal assistant? I need people. Okay, let's go over Super A Tuesday real quick. Whoa, okay. Well, I guess that'll be uh, that'll be that. <laughs> Way to fade out gently. Question number one. Did you watch 
the first episode of Barbecue Pitmasters on Sunday. Uh, I did. Question number two. Did you like the new format of Barbecue Pitmasters on Sunday? I did not. Get that big stuff out of here. Question number three. Your favorite band. Oh, God. (sighs) That's a tough one for me. I'm a grunge kid. So for me, it is Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters. Yeah, love it. I'm actually a many genre fan. All right, let's see. No Harry Carey. All right, Sylvie didn't like Harry Carey. Um, now that would be an interview. Okay. Uh, Patrick, yes, saw it. Yes, liked it. Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, yes. Scott Birkin, favorite band, uh, Moonshine Bandits. Wow, watch out. Shane Draper, Allison Chains. I like Allison Chains too. Meathead showing his age. Uh, the Beatles. Get that big stuff out of here. A burnt ends. Is that a band? <laughs> uh, I'm leery of anyone with a favorite band. Uh, I'll tend to agree. Whiskey Bent. You too. Love to see them in concert. Would love to. The former Split Ends and the Meathead. Uh, their manager's crew. Mother's Finest. Never heard of them. Jolly Mon. Never heard of them. Meat Rake is in. What's up, Meat Rake? Meat Rake pulled some, uh, raked some pork chops last uh, thing I saw. All right, so uh, don't forget the next uh, two weeks, will, or the next week, you will have your chance to win a easy hook if you're, uh, you're, you're not cooking unless you're hooking. Steely Dan, what a pull. You are old, Don. Don't forget, programming note, next week, Huck Jr. will be sitting in for your aforementioned host. I have a pressing matter that will require my full attention next Tuesday, uh, but Huckles has promised to sit in for me uh, already. He has Robin Lindar is going to be joining Huck to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Probably recap the <laughs> third eye blind. Probably recap the uh, whatchamacallit. She was at Memphis in May. Look, I don't know if any of you guys saw this or not. You know, a lot of the food chefs, the uh, the top chefs on the Food Network catch a lot of crap. And uh, Mario Batali is one of them. He, but in this video, he is not catching crap uh, at all. Please enjoy this. Am I going to get a score? Water becoming a more costly. Uh, yeah, whatever. God. I hate to be free video guy, but God, why can't I skip it after the third second? All right, here we go. Check this out. This is awesome. Mario Batali. I loved Iron Chef. I had a blast. We rarely lost. We worked really hard. I worked with the same people all the time. So there was a certain... Let me set this up. This is why he left. Why he left Iron Chef, by the way. So here you go. Intuitive, non-spoken way that we went about making the food. I trusted that Mark Ladner would do the butchering of whatever it is that I brought, and he would bring it to me in small pieces. I knew that Anne would cut up a bunch of vegetables and make pastas, and I would sit over there and make my little sauces, and eventually we'd kind of just bring something together. That doesn't happen in all of those shows, and, and, and the competition doesn't always work when you win or when you lose. It's more about, are you having a good time with it? And when they had judges like you and Jeff Steingarten and Dana Cowan and Ed Levine and people who I, whose opinion I felt merited the ability to criticize my food, uh-huh. that's one thing. But when all of a sudden you get these skinny little actresses from a show called The O.C. and they're saying they don't like raw fish, I'm like, fuck you, why are you talking about my food? <laughs> who, who let you in this room? Oh, oh, I really don't like that. I'm like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> So that's what I got out of it. When all of a sudden the judges weren't in the food industry, they were entertainment people. Which I'm sure their show is great. But it is entertainment, right? Well, it is entertainment, I mean, that's what but, it's supposed right, to but be. someone's going to sit up there and pass judgment on something I spent an hour humping 
to get done. Like busting my balls to get this delicious. And they're going to say, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Of course you wouldn't have done it like that. You're an actor. <laughs> you couldn't have done it like that. Okay. Watch out, Mari Batali on fire, literally. <laughs> yeah, that guy, I, I I agree with him on that. I don't know if you do, but I thought his frankness was beyond reproach. And I believe, you know, if you're just uh, somebody that uh, is known for sticking their finger down your throat and not knowing food, it changes things. What can I tell you? Things that will never change are awesome barbecue commercials promoting people's stores. And it doesn't get any better than this one. Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage. Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage. Better come down here, get some of this shit. You like to eat? America loves to eat. So why not open up somewhere America can sit down, enjoy a meal, and get their feet rubbed? We'll fry anything you want for $5.99. As long as it's friable or edible, we're going to make it deliciousable. We will fry parts of the chicken you didn't even know was friable. The beak, the feathers, we'll fry candy bars. All that European stuff that you don't really normally eat, we'll bring it down here and fry it for you. Ask McDonald's to fry something other than what they normally fry. Guess what you're going to get? Nothing. If it fit through the dough, I'll put it in the fryer. Hell, this is a dinosaur. All our meats are gently tenderized to their eyes. Optimum deliciousness. We got fine dinosaur meat. Took my money, paid me, paid child support. Come on down here and get you a slice. Once they get your social security number, it's over. Motivated, 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 motivated. So, friends, who just decide you don't want no barbecue? Well, that's fine too. Why not let one of my foot specialists or myself perform my magic? Look at that. Don't they look wonderful? If you really pay me enough, we'll massage your feet in any of these sauces also. Success is the rule down here at Jones. Good ass barbecue and foot massage. So go ahead and give me a call or find us on the worldwide internets at the new website. That's J O N E S Big Ass Truck Rental and Storage.com backslash Jones. Good ass barbecue and foot massage. Dot HTML. Excuse me, did you call number 52? Did you hear me call number 52? Oh my. Fabulous. I don't know if that really airs, but God, do I hope it does. Finally, before we push over to Meathead, I am not a politician. I don't watch any of this, but look, one of the most outstanding rants, better than mine, took place in an Illinois Congress thing or whatever. The guy's name is, a, I believe it's a Representative Mike Bost or Senator Mike Bost. The preface or setup to this is uh, as such. There was a bill that was passed or that was given out to these guys as soon as they showed up. It was like a 200-page bill, and they needed to vote on it like within the next hour or two. And the guy simply has had enough. He has had enough. And and it looked a little something like this. Again, total power in one person's hands, not the American way. <laughs> damn Bill Connor! All the damn time! Come out here in the last second! And I gotta try to figure out how to vote for my people! How ashamed of are you should be! Uh -oh. Be ashamed of yourselves! I'm sick of it! Every year! We give power to one person. It was not made that way in the Constitution. He was around when it was written. Now we give him, we pass rules that stop each one of us. Enough! I feel like somebody trying to be released from Egypt. Let my people go! My God, they sent me here to vote for them. They sent me here to fight. Vote for them to argue for them. But I'm trapped. I'm trapped by rules that have been forced down our throats. Folks, we live in a democracy, but not here. But not here. So you go back and you tell your people, I'd like to do that, but the speaker has so much power, so much control, and each one of us do it in their districts. And have to go back and say that. And you can say on your side of the aisle, oh, no, no, that's not the case. 
Watch this microphone. Yes, you do. This microphone's going to get All it. All of us know you got to deal with it. When's it going to stop? Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Go, Mike! Yeah, yeah, Mike, 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 Mike! All right, Mike. Bring it strong. The best part of that whole rant is I was able to section out that whole thing. The best part of the rant, the best 28 seconds. So now I can say stupid stuff like, uh, breaking story, folks. George Mullen, a board of directors, KCBS, was caught MP3 style in the last meeting. Uh, I believe I have sound. It sounded something like this. Total power in one person's hands. Not the American way. These damn bills that come out here all the damn time come out here in the last second. And I got to try to figure out how to vote for my people. You should be ashamed of yourselves. I'm sick of it. Every year we pass rules. That stop each one of us. Enough! I feel like somebody trying to be released from Egypt. Let my people go! Yeah, Mike, 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 Mike. Best soundbite ever. Somebody had to say it, and he was just the guy to do it. All right, gang, take your barbecue to the next level. Wow. Huge. Let my people go. <laughs> With a barbecue institute class, pitmaster Conrad Teddy Bear Haskins uses his years of catering and restaurant experience combined with food science and smoking secrets to help you understand how to improve your barbecue. Backyard barbecuers and those folks who want to open a business drive and fly in from all over the world for the institute's small, friendly, informative classes. The Barbecue Institute has a full class schedule Right now, going on in Texas, everything from short fajita classes to the classics, the briskets, the porks, the ribs, the chickens, the premier class of the year is coming up. Wait a second. Wait, wait. It took place just this past weekend. How did it go, Conrad? We got to adjust that read. It it was uh, held in the uh, McKinley Springs Winery in Prosser, Washington. It's Conrad's favorite place to teach barbecue. I'm sure it went flawlessly. And uh, would love to get some feedback from him as far as how the people liked it. And, of course, he did that whole hog on Sunday. Look, I'm all about QPR. Made a post on Facebook, caught a lot of heat for it. But what I didn't say was that Conrad does only competition barbecue classes and that you're getting uh, somehow gypped by some of these other higher prices. Two different things. I just said he gives really great barbecue classes. Now, maybe you're a backyard warrior like me. Maybe you would benefit from doing like that. How about... 250 bucks or 300 bucks, whatever it is, you know, substantially less expenses than some of these other things, especially if you're not going to be able to take advantage of all of these techniques that the competition people are going to be showing you because you're not a competitor, you know, like me. Now, look, we're not teaching classes on the weekend. Conrad is conducting private classes and corporate events from coast to coast during the week. Also founded OPBBQ.com, where he feeds barbecue to troops and wounded warriors. Now, look, to make your off-site event really memorable... Have a Barbecue Institute off-site party. Show your employees that you care with the very best barbecue that money can buy. They will be taking, well, they'll be taking it right after the party's over for sure. But they will be talking about it for years to come. What does that mean? Employees are happy. What do employee people not do? They don't quit. They feel appreciated and they continue to be productive for it. For all the details about the Barbecue Institute classes, visit bbqinstitute.com or... Check their Facebook page for the latest news and pictures. Again, that's bbqinstitute.com. By the way, uh, Teddy Bear has a gator pit as well. Custom made. All right, we're going to step away, and we will dial up Meathead. You're all excited. I know you are. Stick around. We'll be right back. Live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. 
All right, we are back at it, 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Those are two ways to get in touch with me. Mike Bost hitting huge. I don't even know the guy from the uh, communist state of Illinois. But nevertheless, uh, enough time on people making awesome rants, more awesome than me. We uh, go ahead and race over to the hotline, pull up one of the favorite guests ever of all time. It is, of course, Meathead from Amazing. <laughs> Meathead, what the hell is going on with you? Look at that guy. Oh, okay. what are you talking about? Well, you're gl- you look that perhaps you were like diving into a bong or something crazy like that. Look at those eyes. My I just goodness. thought you gave me a little grief about um, having a glass of wine to finish the show, so making sure animals aren't ready. All right, we're good. So uh, here, here it is, of course, the uh, the song that is taking Billboard and R&B charts by storm. It is your theme song, Ribs Don't Come Easy, It's a Game of Time and Temp. We've talked about it before, Meathead, but never have the words so effortlessly flowed out of the pencil onto paper, right? Oh, it's been a week. Oh, oh a week? <laughs> it's, it, it's, uh, it took you a week to record it, not to write it, right? Uh, who can remember two weeks ago? That's right. It was uh, such a long time ago. Again, uh, we're with Meathead Goldwyn. And again, he is the creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling forum out there right now. It's called AmazingRibs.com if you've never uh, seen it. All right, Meathead, let's get right into it. We've been kind of going back and forth a little bit about uh, your assertion that I am misrepresenting you now to the many tens and twenties <laughs> of pitmasters across the land since maybe a year and a half ago now, where we talked the first time. Differences between barbecue and grilling. Is there a difference? Is there not? Let me go ahead and speak my piece first, and then I will give you... Nay, you're the guest. You go ahead and give your assertion exactly the way it should be. I don't want to misrepresent you in any way. The floor is yours. Well, great. When you run out of things to say to your guests, you always ask them if they Wait. believe what the as hell Meathead you? does. When I run out of no things to say. There's no difference between barbecue and grilling. And I've never said such a thing. I've never said uh, that. I've tried You're a liar. to explain that American history, the culinary history, the culinary technical aspects, and the linguistics of the word barbecue. And try to explain how the word came to be and how it is used in common usage and how it's been used down through history, not just verbally on this show, but I've documented this ad nauseum on my website in an article called Barbecue Defined with quotes from everybody from Samuel Johnson down through James Beard. Who? And Samuel Johnson wrote the first dictionary. Never heard of him. Well, get that big stuff out of here. <laughs> you probably haven't looked at a dictionary in a while. Never. And that's why we're arguing about the definition of barbecue. Um, but uh, what? tell me what your definition of barbecue is. Look, Meathead, we could have this conversation all day long, and people were going to be enthralled because my uh, command of the English vernacular is seismic and gargantuan. I am uh, have a what people would say a rapist's wit. Now listen, here's what I'm saying. <laughs> here's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not here to dispute or get into technical differences with what barbecue the definition is. I'm here merely stating this. Barbecuing and grilling are two different cooking methods. To me, barbecue is between, uh, let's say, 180 or 200 degrees on a low end, going up to, let's say, 250, maybe to 275 on a high end. And it's done indirect. It's done with wood smoke. It's done with typical your typical bigger cuts of meat, your briskets, your pork butts, uh, ribs, uh, whole pieces of uh, chi- well, chicken pieces too, whole chickens, whatever you want to call it. And then there's grilling done at a high temperature, direct heat. So you have meat, you have a grill grate, and then you have whatever the heat source may be, charcoal or propane gas or whatever the case may be, the heating element, you name it. 
and it's done with thinner meats, hamburgers, hot dogs, steaks, typically done in the 15 to 20 minute range. Of course, we could branch off totally into offset or uh, indirect grilling, but I'm just talking about the two main. So to me, these are two different cooking methods. So one doesn't necessarily fall under the other. They're completely separate to me. I'm not arguing. Well, that's to you. Now, I'm not arguing definition about what of history barbecue. and uh, the facts and culinary arts say. All right. Are we are, are we overlapping? I, I'm, I'm. Let me just shut down the screen here. There we go. Oh, you look fine to me. Okay. No, I think uh, I had the uh, the screen overlapping. All right. Uh, historically, the word derives from the word barbacoa. Barbacoa was a wooden rack built by Caribbean Indians, and they originally cooked lizard, snakes, and fish high above a fire where they mostly just smoked it and cured it. So that's where it comes from originally. Now, a lot of barbecue aficionados like to say barbecue is the world's first cooking style. Caveman barbecue meat, and it's the oldest cooking style there is. But if you think about it, what they did was they took a piece of meat and threw it on hot coals. By your definition, that's not barbecue. It's grilling. That's grilling. Absolutely. Now, what I want to tell you is historically, if you go back and look at the use of the word through history, starting with barbacoa, going back to Spain in 1526, following it down through the first dictionary by Samuel Johnson, up through the books by James Beard, common use today, stop 20 people in the barbecue, in a grocery store and ask them, they're barbecuing, and you'll find that barbecue is a big umbrella word. It covers Korean barbecue, it covers Japanese barbecue, it covers Chinese barbecue. Southern barbecue is a style of barbecue, just like Chinese barbecue, and that's closest to what you're talking about. Southern but Southern barbecue, barbecue is and Chinese a big barbecue. Umbrella word. No, Southern barbecue and Chinese barbecue are nothing like each other. Chinese oh. barbecue. I didn't say they were. I didn't you say just they said were. it. They're all covered by the term barbecue. They both have the word barbecue in them. They're both a form of cooking over open flame. They're both a form of culinary uh, culinary style. Grilling is one. Open pit is another. You know, a lot of barbecue experts like to say they're holding up the tradition of barbecue. But the tradition of barbecue, going back to um, the uh, southern slaves, was an open pit. They dig a ditch. They throw in hot coals. They lay green and um, green sticks across and whole animals on top of that. That's direct cooking. It's not indirect. It's open air. These guys are cooking in big steel tubes. That has nothing traditional about cooking in a big steel tube or a device with pellets and a computer attached to it where you set it and forget it. This is just a new form of barbecue. That's competition barbecue. It's a part of the whole world of barbecue that includes Korean and Chinese and uh, uh, South African, braai. Um, these are all forms of barbecue. barbecue you know, remember in high school you were taught that a rectangle has four sides and four right angles and that a square is a rectangle, but not all rectangles are squares. This is a big category that encompasses many cooking styles. What really hacks me off, Greg, you know, and some of your listeners know, I used to be the wine critic for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune, and I got out of that world because the goddamn snobs ruined it. I got really sick of people saying, everybody knows Zinfandel's red, not pink or white, and white Zinfandel. Well, I'm really sick of people saying, oh, you're not having a barbecue, you're grilling. Oh, come on. Don't, don't exclude. Jargon and slang like that is the, is the refuge of people who are trying to prove their inadequacies or o- overcome their inadequacies. Exclude people. Let's open the tent of barbecue to what it really is and invite all those backyard grillers who are doing their ribeye steaks and their hamburgers and hot dogs and let them know that's a form of barbecue. Grilling is a form of barbecue. Not all barbecue is grilling, but grilling is a form of barbecue. Let's let them in the tent. Let's teach them how we barbecue. We use smoke. We use low temperatures. So what you're saying is... If you're going to draw that line so tight, what about 
What's tight? Porky's in Memphis. What's They tight? don't use wood at all. It's only charcoal. What about Dreamland, where they cook at 600 degrees? Are you going to go down to those two restaurants and beloved landmarks and tell them that's not barbecue? I'm not going to say whether it's good barbecue or bad barbecue. That's barbecue. We always say it's barbecue is outdoor cooking. Well, what about all these great restaurants on old, uh, on old hickory pits? Um, th- that's barbecue. It's a much bigger word than these purists think it is. Go ahead. I'll let you get a word in. Well, so, <laughs> you know, I'm going to agree with some of that. But here's the issue. Uh, why open the opening the door, as you say, and letting all of these people in? It's just you, you just can't allow everybody to continually roam around dumb. At some point, you're going to have to educate people that in certain instances, this is what this is. In certain instances, this is what this is. And there's two differentiations of it. Not saying that one is better than the other. They're just two different techniques. So if, if somebody sits next to me and they continually say the word especially, should I just allow them to continually say the word incorrectly? Or do I step in and say, well, it's not especially, it's especially. You sound like an idiot. For people to sit there and say, I'm grilling or I'm barbecuing, and when they're doing one or the other, why should I have to let them continue to be ignorant? Aren't I allowed to say, hey, technically... Because of the way you're cooking it and because of this kind of a heat, you're more typically going in a a grilling sense or a barbecuing sense. People just throwing the words around because they don't know the difference. It's both. It's grilling and barbecue. So if somebody just cooks... I I noticed I'm watching the chat there, and uh, Patio Daddio is one of the brightest guys out there. And also, by the way, a great photographer. You were talking about your first guest, Patio Daddio. That's great photography. Um, Debatable. The... um, uh, he sa- he points out perfectly accurately most of what goes on at a barbecue competition where all the KCBS traditionalists are cooking. But is they're crazy. not. They're not it KCBS not barbecue. traditionalists. It's a culinary style of cooking that involves very little smoke. Um, if you wrap it in foil, there's liquid in there, and that is technically go to any culinary school. Yes, brazy. Yes, I think. Meathead, if you got 10 uh, competition cooks on, they would not say that they are honoring the uh, traditions of barbecue. It's a completely different way of cooking. We've talked about it before. It's a bastardization of barbecue. Top teams on the trail right now would not sit here and say that they are uh, upholding any type of tradition. It's completely different. It's more grilling than barbecue almost. It is barbecue. It's just a... Competition stuff. You have Chinese barbecue, Korean barbecue, grilling, southern barbecue, and competition barbecue, open pit barbecue, closed pit barbecue, a variety of styles of barbecue. And competition barbecue has evolved into a unique style of cooking that doesn't really resemble the traditional style. It's become its own, but it starts with usually indirect heat and smoke, and it's a legitimate form of barbecue. Um, to sit there and say that's not barbecue makes KB, KCBS illegitimate. Of course it's bar- barbecue. Is of course a big it is illegitimate. a word that includes many styles of cooking. All right, so we agree that once again I'm right and you're wrong and we'll move on. All right, so secondly, here's another thing that we wanted to talk about. Uh, Can we put this behind? But do me a favor. Stop asking people without giving them the whole stuff. And if people want to read the explanation, the history, the quote from the from the history books, the old cookbooks. There's a recipe for barbecued shoat, which is the earliest recipe for barbecue I can find. Shoat being a type of hog. Um, it's all on my website under the article "Barbecue Defined." All right, uh, Meathead Goldwyn joining us here on the show, and again the website amazingribs.com. Uh, barbecue Pitmaster Season 3 has emerged once again. It was uh, A lot of people had sneak peek if you're kind of like an insider, which is the only way I'm going to be able to see it is for sneak peeks. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, so it's on a you know, really weird channel. Who cares? Whatever. So it's back on, and uh, I kind of gave my take on it. I'm just not a fan of this format of show. I love everybody on it. Okay, uh, I love uh, you know I love Carolina Rib King. I love whoever else is going to be on it. I probably talk to a lot of them, and I hope everyone does well and they all win and they get outrageous success and they're continuing to promote the sport of barbecue and all this other great stuff. The bottom line is, I just don't like this style of show. So, if I didn't have any interest in barbecue, I wouldn't watch it. 
It's just not compelling enough to me. I'm not able to build a vested uh, relationship with somebody because they win and they move right to the finals. I want to see them three or four times. I want to see them go through some hardships. I want to see their kid throw up in their face or do whatever <laughs> so I can get some type of relationship together. Which it, That's what it's lacking for me and why I don't necessarily like it. What do you think? Well, last season's show was a game show. And um, the problem with like, – there were several problems. I, I blogged about it every week in my regular column on Huffington Post, and I'm doing that again. It, this year is so much better than last year in many ways, with some notable exceptions. Last year, my biggest bitch was we didn't learn anything about cooking. We didn't see them cook. We didn't see their technique. We didn't see what they did. This year, they don't give away all the secrets. They don't spend a lot of time. But you see a lot more of what goes into their rubs. You see a lot more of their injections. You hear what temp temp they're cooking at, how long they expect to cook their ribs. If you pay attention, if you're interested, if you're just getting into serious barbecue of this style, competition barbecue, they learn a lot more this year than last year. Now, I agree with you. The first season, we really got to follow five or six guys. The problem with the, the the first season was is everybody we followed never won nothing. I mean, it was it was like, you know, the old Bill Cosby bit where the coach got everybody excited and then they ran towards the exit and to go on the field and the door was locked. There was nothing to get excited about. Um, this year they got a winner every week. Um, the production values have slipped considerably. During the first show, they actually had to put captions under some of the speakers, not because they were speaking a foreign language, but because the audio was so bad you couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. That fixed, that's been fixed in the second show, which is aired, and I just watched the third show today because I got it in advance. And um, I just think there's a lot more to learn from these guys. And there's no rattlesnake. There's no gator. Um, they're cooking conventional meats that you and I would cook in a backyard or on our smokers. Um, uh, the first show was... Um, uh, beef brisket and uh, Santa Maria style tri tip, and it was interesting. One or two of the guys had no idea what to do with tri tip. Not barbecue. <laughs> it's Santa Maria barbecue. Uh, the evidence of which is the National Barbecue Association held their conference this year in San Diego, right. celebrating Santa Maria style barbecue. It's a style of barbecue, legitimate American style of barbecue. Absolutely. Uh, cooking over uh, over wood, red oak, um, sm- red oak. Um, I mean, it's just a different style of barbecue. Um, this year, they've made an attempt to make the judging blind. Last year, there was no attempt to make the judging blind, and that really rigged it. Um, this year, they're making an attempt. I think the judges have a pretty good idea who they're tasting because they go out and they can hang out around the pits. They can see, and I think in some cases, them assembling their boxes. They have a rough idea. They may not know precisely I heard Marcus last week say that uh, he didn't think they did. Maybe they don't know for sure, but I got a feeling they got a sense for what's coming. They've got better judges this year. They got barbecue judges. I liked Art Smith last year. He's a real chef. He really knows cooking. But this year they've got um, three really good barbecue judges, and uh, they know their stuff, and they're sizing the food appropriately, I think. Um, so I think that they've solved a lot of the major problems from last year. It still can be better, and I'm sure that before the season's over, you and I and everybody else who watches it will have ideas. But the nice thing is is Marcus is trying to make money at this, and he's listening. And I think he really improved this year, and I think maybe he'll take it another step if it gets renewed. I mean, it got bumped down to this American destination as a channel, which nobody gets. Well, from what I understand... The uh, whoever the American destination. This was like a, a pick, they picked the show to go on. So I'm I'm assuming if it does even halfway decent or whatever benchmarks they have set for the first couple shows, if it's one that they would pick to show to maybe bring a demographic over, whatever the case may be, there might be a chance this thing is picked up mid season for for another season, maybe later this year or, or maybe next year, so they can you know fit something else into it. Uh, So I think that there is a built-in potential win in that regard because this is a you know they didn't have to pitch it this was picked finally by somebody now of course you know the detractor is 
the station that picked it and, and where it's located and how many people can actually get it. Yeah, I, I don't know what the ramifications are. I know that um, in March, I think it was, I had dinner with Marcus out in San Diego at the National Barbecue Association Conference. We talked about it, and he didn't know where it was going to end up or even if it was going to be produced. Then a few weeks later, they're on the road shooting, and, I mean, they were shooting in March and April, and it's airing in late May. So this is a really short turnaround time. So I just think, you know, as people have been saying since day one of season one, put barbecue on TV. I'm okay with it. Um, I wish it were better, but hey, you know we're 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 building an audience, and gosh knows barbecue is growing in popularity. Absolutely, uh, Meathead Goldwyn joining us here on the show. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, step away here very briefly. We'll do a quick read, and we'll come back and talk to him about. Uh, maybe the Barbecue Hall of Fame, maybe uh, his work with Dr. Blonder, lots of things to talk about. Now, as many of you know, I've gotten my hands on a pellet cooker. I know, not barbecue, right, guys? First thing I thought of, barbecuers alike. Why? Because these are widely considered to be the pellets for your pellet-fired cookers. That's right, whether you're on the competition trail or in your backyard, folks choose barbecuers alike wood pellets more than any other brand. For their superior quality and flavor, you should give them a try as well. You can do it at BBQ rsdelight.com now maybe you don't have a pellet cooker no problem you can still take advantage of this pellet revolution on your gas or charcoal grill or smoker by grabbing the cast iron pot option you buy yourself a nice sampler pack of pellets you load one third cup into a pot and then you place it into your cooker or grill let that sweet succulent smoke take care of the rest now maybe you're not familiar with pellets let me give you a little insight here when pellets are made all of the air within the cellular structure of the wood is evacuated thus concentrating the wood into a very dense form, much denser than natural trees. And as compared to other wood flavor enhancers, pellets will yield more intense smoke more quickly, which seals the food, locking in natural moisture and adding smoke flavor exactly when it is needed. Now, since pellets have been processed from sawdust, by pressure, which generates heat, any contaminants present in the wood are eliminated. And this process produces a sterile smoking wood product of consistent quality. Pellets are easy to use since you don't have to soak them in water prior to use. And it's easy to blend wood flavors and produce consistent results each and every time when you use barbecuers or light wood pellets. Here's something you didn't know. Those little one-pound bags, all flavor wood. But when you get them for your cookers, for the fuel, a little, little bit of a recipe going on. Two-thirds oak, one-third flavor wood, which has been determined by Candy and the folks over at Barbecuers Delight. Because you need to have that consistent BTU temperature to burn for everything to work properly. So do yourself a favor. Grab some Barbecuers Delight wood pellets right now. Visit them at BBQRSDelight.com. That's BBQRSDelight.com. Check out all of the flavors they have. Stop fussing with the sticks and the chunks. Go to Barbecuers Delight, the choice of competition cooks and backyard hacks just like me. Barbecuers Delight, that's BBQRSDelight.com. Barbecuers Delight. All right, we'll come right back with Meathead, get into a few more options. A lot of people saying that I lost this barbecue uh, grilling thing. I've talked to myself in the circles. Ridiculous. I'll continue to refute that all day long. I don't care. It's my show. I can. We'll be right back. Stick by 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. More with Meathead right after this. Interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue. It's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, we are back 40 past the hour of 10 o'clock. All right, Meathead, uh, I'm trying to figure out where we want to go next. Do you want to do uh, Barbecue Hall of Fame, or do you want to do... Uh, Dr. Blonder scientific stuff. Nice hat, by the way. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not a chef, but I play one on the internet. Play one on the internet. So do I. Go ahead. Uh, let's talk about this really interesting research um, that Dr. Blonder has done. <clears throat> Folks who listen in occasionally know that I have on retainer a physicist who used to 
head research at Bell Labs, and he's a barbecue lover. And I ask him stupid questions, and he finds me answers. And they're really often mythbusters. Um, I wanted to know about smoke and what makes it adhere. And uh, it, it, the, what we'll talk about here is documented in detail on my website in the article on the Zen of Wood and Smoke. But he did some really interesting experiments. Um, he, um, uh, the, the conclusion was is that smoke adheres more easily to wet surfaces and cold surfaces. So the takeaway is, is don't take your meat out to come up to room temp if you want more smoke flavor. Now, this is probably really germane to you pellet smokers because you're always bitching that there's not enough wood smoke. Cold meat, wet meat, and I have been saying for years, leave the lid closed, walk away, don't open it, don't spritz, don't spray. You're just letting out humidity, you're letting out heat, you're adding oxygen to the fire. But he has shown that moisture on the surface is sticky for smoke, um, and that smoke will stick to a moisture surface. So mopping, which is what the old guys have been doing for years, basting and spritzing, actually helps smoke adhesion. And he's done some really interesting experiments. He's demonstrated that there is like a really thin layer of, uh, of air around the meat that um, uh, repels the smoke. And, well, I mean, the most important thing is, is when you think about it, the vast majority of the smoke goes right up the chimney. Um, it, it, it just never makes contact with meat. Um, the, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm still fooling around with this silly uh, screen here, Greg. I'm getting echo. Um, Full attention, please. Full attention. Yeah, yeah. I love Skype. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, he talks about the what makes blue smoke. Blue smoke occurs because it's the smallest smoke particles. They're only about a micron in size, and they scatter the wavelengths all except blue. White smoke is a larger small, uh, smoke particle. Gray smoke, larger still, and black smoke, even larger than that. Um, and, of course, blue smoke is the smoke that we all think gives us the best flavor, and, and he agrees. Um, he talks about this halo of air. He calls it the boundary layer. Um, uh, and it's viscous air and it sticks to the meat partially because of the surface of the meat the smoother the surface the thinner the layer and less there is and he says your rub actually acts to roughen the surface to make that uh, airflow uh, around the meat go by faster um, uh, so um that's an issue to consider. Um, so are you saying you shouldn't rub your meat in order to get more smoke Well, I think flavor? you have to. I think you have to, and everybody agrees. But it is, in a sense, um, causing uh, this sticky layer. Um, did he mention anything about And one of the, the other things he did was uh, a really interesting experiment where he took filter paper and wetted, two, wetted one pad of filter paper and left another one dry – Put them in a uh, smoker, and the wet one is dark brown, and the dry one is pure white. Um, and so he talks about part of the reason is what he calls thermophoresis. The wet one is being cooled by evaporation, and that's attracting the smoke um, because of the coolness. So it's just really interesting stuff, and it's detailed more accurately on my website. But um, there may be some take-home lessons for uh, competitors and other cooks. And that website is AmazingRibs.com if you want to check it out. Did he mention anything? Or did you guys talk at all about this magical 140-degree internal temperature where meat is supposedly supposed to stop taking smoke at that point? No. Um, we didn't go into that, but I think the research demonstrates that that's not likely to be the case, that the smoke is not really sucked into it like a sponge. It, it's particles. They're microscopic particles as small as one micron, but they land on the surface and stick. 
Now, once they're on the surface, they dissolve and they mix with liquids there and they may be pulled in by diffusion, but not very far. Now, he's working on um, smoke ring now, and we don't have the data back yet. It's really interesting. We learned, we were puzzling about it the other day, and I said, Greg, how come whitefish doesn't get smoke ring? And the light went off, and he said, it must be the myoglobin. So he's digging into that, and he's playing with the chemistry, and um, we're hoping to have some answers about what really causes smoke ring. All right, uh, Meathead Goldwyn joining us here on the show. Uh, d- so have you pretty much dispelled then if you're looking, uh, you're not cooking because you're in there basting and spritzing, or does one not have anything to do with the other? Well, they're, they're interesting parallel issues. That's another research project he's done. I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but again, that's on our website. Uh, I have a whole page devoted if you're looking, you're not cooking. Um, a lot of it has to do with the type of year and the type of fire you're using, but, um, Pretty much open the lid and a lot of hot air flows out. But you close the lid and hot air builds up in there in a hurry. You don't lose a heck of a lot. Now, cookers like a pellet cooker that have a thermostat recover really rapidly because they pump more heat into the space. Um, but uh, there are charts and tables and graphs from a Weber kettle to a pellet grill. We don't have access to a big steel um, you know, a jambo, but logically, after you read this article, you can see big steel jambo like that is holding a lot of heat. So you open that up, the hot air spills out, but the pit still holding heat. The important thing to consider here, and this is where a lot of people get lost, is that the air heats only the outside of the meat. The air doesn't heat the inside of the meat. The outside of the meat heats the inside of the meat. So you can open that pit and you let the hot air out. You slow down the heating of the outside of the meat. But the outside of the meat is still hot, and it's still pushing heat down into the center. So it has very little effect on the meat. Very little. Very little. All right, interesting to know. So we don't have to worry. So we can look and cook at the same time now and tell those people they're crazy. Um. And if obviously, like in cold weather, in winter, it has more of an effect. Uh, right. But, uh, um, yeah, you can look and cook. All right, good to know. So I can uh, look and cook, thank goodness. I was always very worried about that. Now, look, <laughs> uh, last thing before uh, we call it a night, uh, Barbecue Hall of Fame has been announced. This was, for the longest time, a, a pathetic, miserable attempt that just existed online, and now the American Royal has bought the, I guess, rights to it or whatever. So they're going to ramp it up. They're going to make brick-and-mortar places, something you're going to be able to visit if you go to the rodeo portion or if you're going to uh, the actual competition itself that's held every year, and you can kind of see who has kind of came before us in this barbecue world. And they have, like, three different sections. And who knows if this will change down the line, but this year the new line of inductees uh, for the pitmasters section is Johnny Trigg. For industry slash business is Henry Ford. And thirdly, they have a celebrity section, and uh, Guy Fieri makes it in for that. I don't know if you're familiar with any of this uh, Hall of Fame stuff, but you know, just as somebody who, you know, you're a sports fan, you know all these other halls of fame, basketball, baseball, football, you name it. What are your initial thoughts? How does it hit you for a, a barbecue Hall of Fame? I didn't realize there was such a thing until you told me about it, and thank you very much. I went looking for it. You can't find it on the Internet, (laughs) except references to KCBS, and they don't have anything online yet. But I think it's a great idea. I think there's some fun things that can be done with it. Um, I think that it'd be hard to argue um, uh, Henry Ford, although it is well established on the Internet that he invented charcoal. That's just not so. Correct. There was a uh, there was a patent yep. which I have uncovered and, and wrote about on my website in my article on the Zen charcoal that preceded Henry Ford by I think fifty years. Um, he was the one that started mass producing it. Um, it was the guy who originally patented was a guy Ellsworth Zwyer, um, and I think that uh, certainly he should be included. Um, so should um, Edison's partner, E.B. Kingsford. Uh, I think 
Everybody knows Carolyn Wells. My God, is there one person in this world who has done more to popularize barbecue than this woman? Um, and her husband, Paul Kirk, Artie Davis, George Stephen, who fed to the Weber kettle. Okay, Greg said. What? <laughs> That's not barbecue. That's grilling. Oh no, 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 no! I that, that that's different stuff. I mean, we're talking about real pioneers of okay, you know okay. of the industry as a whole. Now, I believe there was there's a very small that's, that's handful of people. Of what was that? Can we let it's a barbecue ball thing. We let the guy who invented the Weber kettle in there. Uh yes, because he also invented the Weber Smoky Mountain, which is barbecue. Thank you. I don't think he invented. I think he probably is something on his staff. We're, we're splitting hairs. I'll give so you a pass on this. There's, uh, I, there's a small handful of people that are already in whatever this Hall of Fame is currently existing. I believe Gary and Carolyn Wells are already in. Um, I oh, believe I uh, is John Willingham is in. And uh, there were a few other people that I can't think of right off the top of my head. But Well, Arthur Charlie Bryant uh, from... Arthur Bryant? No, he's not in. Charlie Virgos, Rendezvous? No, nope, not in. What about what about John Marcus? John who? Marcus. What about him? He could be, see. So here's the thing, right? So now you have you have a, a pitmaster section, you have a business and industry, and then you have a celebrity. So I don't have a, a problem yeah. with the first two, but Let's talk so about Fieri. yeah. So so you have I a mean, celebrity section. Say over Fieri. Any day, if you're gonna pick, all right. Chef, so let's talk about that. Is is Bobby Flay? A, is, is a latecomer to the party. Flay has been he, he's been doing barbecue and grilling on TV for decades. Uh, Gary does show competitions every now and then. He goes buddy buddy cooking crowd, but Flay can cook circles around him. And Flay's been broadcasting on the subject, uh, taught millions how to grill and barbecue. If you're going to pick a celebrity, I'd take Flay over Fieri any day. For the grilling or for the barbecuing, Meathead? <laughs> They're both barbecue. All right. So uh, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I'm just saying that it seems that the category of celebrity opens up a huge gray area of yep. awkwardness, much like yeah. uh, the continuation of garnish staying in the optional state of KCBS rules. I mean, it should be yes or no, yeah. not optional. Yeah. But so yeah, who, there's no celebrity hall of fame in the baseball, right. the football, you know, this is their way of drawing attention. And when they have an induction ceremony, they can have Bobby Flay or Guy Fieri show up in the public to pay to see it. I mean, that's, you know, it, it's, goofy. I, I believe that at some point these people will realize that the pub grab has been found out very quickly and that they might go to look to, to bring maybe two pit masters in, or, or they might just redesign it all together. But it's so subjective. What celebrity to me might not be celebrity to you. Obviously, you know, Meathead, if you and I are walking down the street with Guy Fieri, uh, everybody's going to know who he is and they're not going to know who we are. So celebrity in that sense, yes, but... Tom Hanks isn't going into the Baseball Hall of Fame or, or the Women's Baseball Hall of Fame because he right. acted as the manager in uh, League of Their Own. Right. Cuba Gooding Jr. isn't going into the NFL Hall of Fame because he got a uh, uh, he won Best Supporting Actor Academy Award for Jerry Maguire. Perfect. So I think it's a little foolish myself. Yeah, it's a it's obviously a ploy for publicity. Uh, absolutely. All right, uh, Meathead. Anything else you want to get out before I let you go tonight? I think we've covered a lot of territory here. I just, uh, uh, if people are not watching Pitmasters, I don't know if they're aware. The first one was won by a guy named Solomon Williams of California Rib Kings in Georgetown, South Carolina. Second one by Melissa Cookston of Memphis Barbecue Company. Everybody knows her. She's won so many competitions. Great lady. Get a little cocky out there. Uh, I know who won the Is third she? one, but I'm, I can't say. Is she getting a little but, cocky uh, out there? Oh, I had to laugh. I mean, she she made some crack about uh, Myron. The 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 the, um, the gerbil is running fast, but its brain is dead, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think that uh, you know, and I've interviewed her a number, actually, a couple times just over the past three or four weeks. Uh, one about a restaurant, and then uh, after she won Memphis in May, she con- she continues at least on air. 
to be very humble, uh, to not expect to win anything. And mm-hmm. I think I think she could trend more to cocky or confident with what she has accomplished in her career. I just don't necessarily think that that might be in her makeup. And don't be fooled by what you see on this television. Yeah, good point. It is so – I don't understand. You're uh, right. I've, I've spent time with her, and she's just the greatest lady on earth. Who's, who's, who, who is competing in the third episode? Don't tell us who wins, but who's competing? Who can we look forward to seeing? I can't tell you, otherwise they'll take away my uh, privileges uh, oh. to watch in advance. But um, you, it's a good competition. The second one was much better than the first one. The, t- the level of competition was much higher. They led with a light jab and uh, in the issue one. Um, uh, the fellow from South Carolina who won it, um, probably a good cook, but he didn't distinguish himself in that show. Uh, but in the second show, Melissa did, and the competition was tough. Mo Kaysen, Right on her heels, six tenths of a point behind. Uh, some good cooking, it looked like. And the third show is really interesting. Um, there is a curve thrown at these guys, not too big a curve, and uh, it's close. Makes for a good show. I know. I think it's a good show. Um, I think there's good cooks there, two of them at least. All right. Well, so good enough. Uh, so be sure to tune in if you have it in your package. Uh, that sounded weird. And uh, we are talking with Meathead Goldwyn. You can find him at AmazingRibs.com. Meathead, always appreciate the conversation, and uh, we look for you again next month. See you next month. You got it. There he is. Meathead. All right. Spirited discussion. Do the guy... Randy had a... An interesting comment up there asking why uh, men get a little bent out of shape when women win. I don't think that's the case. I think Meathead was under the impression he was seeing her on television. What have we learned about barbecue on television? You know, it might not be exactly the way you see it. A lot of editing things going on. She was on this show. She didn't even expect to make finals. She didn't expect to win. I don't even know if she wanted to win with uh, the way she was feeling. She seems very humble. Too humble for me. But then again, I like to let it hang out a little bit. Not in that way, by the way. All right, gang, let me quickly uh, talk to you about Tasty Lake's Barbecue Supply. Look, there are uh, unsavory business and creeping marauders around each and every turn on the Internet. And sometimes you have a barbecue or grilling item that you want to get, but you don't have it in your hometown or the next town over, so you have to go on that Internet. And you start to sweat a little bit. You're not sure if it's going to happen for you. You want to feel confident. But the company you're buying from is Honest and Fair. Great news. Let Fred Bernardo and the gang over Tasty Lakes Barbecue relieve you of your internet buying stress. They have one of the most complete inventories of barbecue and grilling items anywhere on the face of the earth. All of them are in Fred's stock room, and they're ready to ship to you directly. Now, are there other places on the internet that might have the item cheaper, perhaps? But are you 100% confident that you're actually going to get the item that you buy? How long is it going to take to ship to you? All great questions that, unfortunately, no one will be able to answer with 100% assurity. That's why when you buy from Tasty Lake's Barbecue Supply, the items are in the store. Hi, this is Scott Greenia from Fairfax, Vermont, also known as Scotty BQ, and you're listening to the Uh, Barbecue Central Show. Hold on. You know, are you kidding me? Give me back my read music right now. Anyway, Tasty Lake's carries grill smokers, ceramic cookers, Electric cookers, various charcoal types, wood chunks, chips, cookbooks, accessories. They don't have it. You don't need it. On top of all that, they carry a lot of the other show sponsors' products in the store. So it's almost like you're doing a two-for-one, shopping at a sponsor and buying sponsor products as well. Best of both worlds. Don't forget, Tasty Licks has their own line of barbecue sauces and rubs as well, so be sure to try those. You head on over to TastyLicksBBQ.com and let the confidence exude from you. As you make your online purchases. Then enjoy the items upon delivery. Don't forget that Fred and the gang are there to help you after the sale as well. Tasty Licks Barbecue Supply. That's TastyLicksBBQ.com. Let's wrap it up right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Get in the smoke. Call 877-448-0433 to get on the air. Now, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, uh, one past the left. Thanks again to Meathead for joining me. 
We recapped the argument on um, grilling and barbecue, which many people think that I lost. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, I see what I did. Oops. Everybody that was just listening to the uh, radio audio stream, sorry about that. Sorry about that. That was my fault. Let me turn it off now, though. There we go. So I'll, I guess I'll take my loss. Whatever. I will continue to maintain that they are two different cooking styles. Uh, offset or indirect cooking with wood. Bigger cuts of meat at uh, certain temperatures. Grilling different. And then we can, you know, bastardize it down from there. Grilling higher heat. Meat. Grill great. Heat. There you go. All right, there you go. Let's do this. Let's bust out. We're going we're gonna to continue to see it different ways. That's all I can say. Second, our guests. Correct, Meathead. That's right. As a matter of fact, I think before I uh, close the show, many of you didn't know this, uh, and Meathead didn't want me to share this with you. However, he was caught, uh, mic'd up, going at it with somebody, and I believe uh, it sounded a little something uh, like this. Total power in one person's hands. Not the American way. These damn bills that come out here all the damn time come out here in the last second. And I gotta try to figure out how to vote for my people! You should be ashamed of yourselves! I'm sick of it! Every year! We pass rules that stop each one of us! Enough! I feel like somebody trying to be released from Egypt! Let my people go! There you go. Enough is enough. I feel like somebody trying to get out of Egypt in the barbecue world. Let my people go. So thanks to Meathead. All right. He's sick of it. That's right. Sick of it. But the Benny Hill theme song makes you feel good after his rant, right? Uh, Next Tuesday, reminder, I will be not here. Huck Jr. from Huck's Hut will be sitting in. So there will be a live show at the Pup will be hosting. I will be back the week after that. Two things before I let you go tonight. If you have cast iron grill grates, let's help protect the rusty grill grate population. Or let's help protect the cast iron grate population. Let's not have rust. If you have cast iron, raw cast iron, season it after each and every use. And it will provide you with generations of rust-free service. You know, once rust gets on that cast iron, it is a bitch to stop from spreading. Also, September 11, 2001, I will never forget, just like right there, until two weeks from Tuesday when we will re-adjourn for another live edition of the Barton Central Radio Show. It's your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now. <laughs>